This afternoon, it's my pleasure to introduce the panel for the business of CO2 removal, capture, and storage. The moderator will be James Lawler, who is the founder of Climate Now, and joining him will be Nia Kundi Mikola, CSU at CSU from CSU Bakersfield in economics, Alexei Vistotsky, who's the general manager for carbon capture, utilization, and storage at Chevron New Energies. Ruth Ivory Moore, who is the policy and advocacy manager for Global CCS, for the Global CCS Institute, and Bruno Solomon from the National Cement. Thank you, Tony. <clears throat> All right, so in our panel today, we're going to talk about the business of carbon capture and storage. So uh, we've got a really impressive group of experts here and uh, Tony's given their, their brief introduction, so I think we'll just dive into some of the questions that we, that we have. Um, I'd like to start, uh, Ruth, with you. Um, so, as we heard earlier from George, you know, there's an urgent necessity of decarbonizing, meaning moving toward um, low carbon solutions for everything from our, you know, our hard to abate sectors, you know, decarbonizing our, our power generation, um, and decarbonizing industrial processes. So against that backdrop, what, would you, what is the role of carbon capture and storage, and, and how significant a role is it thought to be? Thanks a lot, James. Um, I guess against that backdrop, what I want to say that it's a necessity. It's a, one of the key mitigation tool that's really needed globally in order to meet the 2030 goals of reducing carbon CO2 emissions by 50% by 2005 and also reaching carbon neutrality by 2050. Now you asked me to be asked us to be brief so I could talk all day on the why but just to let you know that we really can't get there without CCS. You know there are sectors that uh, do not produce carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuel, but from their own processes. And right now, these are sectors like cement and like steel, iron, and we can't get there without this. So we have to be able to remove carbon dioxide from point sources and also from the atmosphere. And right now, CCS is the only technology that's viable for those, for those type of industries. Additionally, not only are we saying that from an industry perspective or from an NGO perspective, but we're also seeing it from the scientific community. The IPCC report says that we can't get to 2030 or 2050 without CCS. So it's not the only tool, but it's a key mitigation tool. And how much CO2 do, does the IPCC and other groups say we need to remove through carbon capture and storage? And how much are we removing today globally through CCS? Just to, just to get a sense of the delta between where we are and where we need to go. I think what I, need, what I want everybody to understand is to listen not exactly to the specific number, but to the units. Right now, the IPCC, they're saying that we need to reach an annual capture of about 1.6 gigatons, billions, in order by 2030. We need to reach 7.6 gigatons, billions, of storage by 2050. Right now, where we are in the U.S., we're doing about 24.1 million, million to billion, significant. Globally, we're doing, if you count EOR, about 50, but if you take out ERR, you're somewhere less than maybe 48 million tons per year, million tons per year. So we're in a position now that we need to ramp up to get to billions of tons of storage and capture, in which barely we're just in the millions. Mm -hmm. So you have several, so there's several orders of magnitude between what's happening today and, you know, what our science is telling us in terms of where we have to go. And so it's, it's pretty clear that we're not going to get there through, you know, massive subsidies. You know, there's going to have to be real business models that encourage this to happen at, at significant scale. And so <clears throat> I'd like to turn to you, Alexi, and ask you, um, what, what are the potential business models, you know, and to what, to, to what extent are these beginning to emerge today? that could help us 
breach these you know, multiple orders of magnitude in terms of scale of this industry. Well, perfect. Thanks for that, James. And I'm glad to be here. And maybe just, maybe, maybe if I may, I'll, I want to add first to what Ruth said uh, to put things in perspective. Uh, one thing I want to make sure that everyone is clear is that it's not our game, right? We're not saying CCUS or bust here, right? It's always an AND game. So CCS is one of the tools. It's a necessary tool, but it's one of the portfolio of tools that, that we need. So I think that's important to remember. Sorry. Oh, come a little closer to the microphone, maybe. Oh, closer. So it's important to remember that it's an AND game, and CCS is one of the many tools that we need to make significant uh, progress in the next uh, decades. Uh, and the second point I would like to make, and it's a good visual, uh, what Ruth said that you know, we need to go from 40 million tons uh, per year to 1.6 gigaton. So if you put it in perspective, like Project Quest was referenced earlier, and Project Quest in Canada, it inject 1 million ton of CO2 per year. So you need to build three of those projects per week between now and 2030 to get you to the targets, right? So the scale of what is ahead of us, it's, it's huge. So it's very uh, ambitious goals, and the only way to, um, to get there is we all kind of have to get aligned and, and do it. Yeah. Anyways. So talk to us about the value chain of, of CCS as a business. Absolutely. So, you know, you've got, you, you know, at some, what's the value chain between the CO2 molecules floating around in the air and the CO2 being underground? Like, what's yeah. that, what are the links in that chain? No, absolutely. So let me first kind of, uh, I guess the bigger question is how, you, how we make it work, right? And how do we start it? So it all starts, of course, with a, we have a target set by Paris Accord that every country agrees to meet. Then they go, every country goes back and says, this is how I'm going to meet it. And every country puts dollars towards policy that will enable CCS. Well, today there are four, and right now, the only thing that you can really uh, rely on is a policy. So it is a taxpayer dollars in the short term. But there's really four models that exist today in how countries do it. One is Australian model, and it's a stick model, right? You will do it or you will pay fine. And then there's a Canadian and the US model, and that's the uh, a funding like 45Q in US and tax credit in Canada. And those are the carrots model, right? It's a pool. And then you have Europe, which is somewhere in between where uh, UK government, they help you to facilitate hubs. They pick the, um, the winners in a way, and they, uh, certain winners start to progress those hubs and construct them, and government refunds up to 70%. So that's kind of how it's set up now. So it's all through um, subsidies. Now, you're correct that this is not sustainable long term, and ha something has to change. Uh, and I think the long-term vision is the way it would work, it's a consumer would have to be the one who's driving the right behaviors. For example, LNG cargo coming out of Australia with a low carbon intensity index would have a higher price and higher value than the one without it, right? So in the longer term, that's probably how the markets will have to work. But in the next you know, decade or two, you know, uh, policies, are important and will be the key drivers. So in your modeling at, at Chevron New Energies, what do you think about the, about the long-term future of voluntary carbon markets as a facilitator for expansion of, of this industry? I mean, because today, I think, you know, for the highest, highest value carbon credits that you can acquire, meaning verifiable CO2 removed, you, you know, command something in the order of 600 to thousand dollars per ton. So it's not trivial in terms of the amount. Um, but do you think that that plays a role or like longer term or do, or do you see it as really, it's consumer driven. So people, consumers will pay higher prices for things that were, where the value chain was carbon negative. Yeah. So I guess there, there's Two things. So I think probably all of the above. So you're talking about the offset market, or how it's very high yeah. now. Well, it's all about supply, demand, and where the, the curves will intersect, and offsets will play a big role in it, and it will incentivize progress. But also, I think consumers. You know, when you go to you know, maybe 30 years from now, when you go to buy a computer, you're going to have two labels: low carbon computer and not. Kind of like organic foods mm -hmm. now, right? Mm -hmm. You pay six dollars for the quart of milk uh, if it's organic and you play three dollars if it's uh, regular and so that's the I think long term it has to be uh, something like that yeah makes sense um, so 
Uh, Bruno, I'd love to ask you a question. So how does National Cement think about the business case for CCS in terms of cement, in cement production? Because, you know, you have one of these businesses that could fall into the category that Alexei just described, namely producing a product that is a lower carbon version of what you're maybe doing now. And how do you think about that in terms of that margin and the value associated with doing that? Well, thank you. Uh, uh, first, it's the good thing about being last today in the panel is, is that it's been really fantastic to hear all those passionate people talking about decarbonization. And, and it really reinforced our belief that uh, if we want to be the first net zero cement plant in California, it's the right time and we are at the right place and we are the right partners there. So thank you for everything that everybody has said uh, today. Thank you also for everybody that have been uh, mentioning cement today. A lot of people have mentioned cement, so uh, you, you, you just have. And uh, cement is, is a special industry when it comes to CO2. Uh, it's a difficult, what, call, what we call hard to abate uh, industry because um, part of our process when we make cement is to use limestone, that's the main raw material, and limestone geologically is made of lime and CO2. And when we make cement, we break that and we keep the lime and the CO2 goes off the stack. And there is just not any other way to make cement today. So that CO2 is very difficult to abate and that's about 60% of what we are, uh, we are emitting. By the way, cement uh, is a big uh, CO2 emitter. It's 1.8% of the emission in California. So it's a big emitter. Um, however, we, we feel that it's an opportunity for California, for Kern County to have cement plant as CO2 is a, is a global problem. So we could just say, okay, let's move the cement plant somewhere else and we get rid of the problem. That's a naive approach. It's naive because when we do that, we cannot work with the producer of CO2. We don't have a control, we don't find solution and we don't find long-term solution. We are just closing our eyes and keeping and driving and crashing into the, into the wall. So cement industry, National Cement, have, have long been aware of the, of the urgency to act. Uh, I mean, we are not waking up today because it's you know, the flavor of the month talking about, about CO2. We've been doing a lot of things for a long time, but clearly we are accelerating today. Mm -hmm. And all the cement world has published a roadmap, strategies that are clear, so we can become carbon neutral 2040, 2045, 2050, depends which place in the world you are at. California is at the forefront of, of uh, decarbonization. Uh, it's the only place in the world where there is a, a, a legal mandate for cement to become carbon neutral by 2045. It's a law, it's called SB 596. And this is the only place in the world. So it shows the challenge and we are ready for that. We are embracing that challenge. How we are doing it? We are adopting a stepped approach. We are trying to do a lot of smaller things first, uh, energy efficiency, because the less energy we use, the less CO2 goes at the stack. So that's the obvious thing to do, energy efficiency. We are working on fuel switching, switching from uh, fossil fuel to uh, biogenic, biomass type of fuel or other product that uh, I would say uh, today would end up in, in landfills that don't have a value, but we are giving value to those products. And, and when we do that, we are also creating growth in the local economy. Mm -hmm. We are doing those things, we are creating new type of cement that are lower carbon cement, subject that we've not talked about today and we don't have time to, today to talk about it, but we are developing 
a whole range of new type of cement using usually local raw material, limestone, clay, that we don't transform, we put directly into the product and we are lowering uh, the intensity. That said, all those things we have to do, they are going to bring us maybe 30, 40% reduction. And then remains 50, 60% of emission, and there comes the capture process, the transport process, the storage process, and maybe the usage process at, at some later point. So it is a necessity for us to work on, on capturing carbon. We have no other choice. Um, again, uh, we think that capturing, it's not anymore about, it, it's not a technical problem anymore. The technology exists. We know how to capture uh, carbon. We are much more talking about an issue of uh, economics. It's going to be a, a very massive effort to finance the capturing, the transporting, uh, the pipeline, the infrastructure development, and uh, of course the injection into, into wells. And it's really an effort that one company cannot do on its own. Mm -hmm. We have to uh, partner with the right people, people that can inject, people that can transport, people that can develop technologies, and that's academia. And it's really, uh, and of course, people that are writing regulation and permitting. Mm -hmm. So it's an effort of all the stakeholders that we have to do together. Uh, but we are convinced that, you know, 2045, 2050, it seems like it's a long time away, maybe a short time away. Uh, but, but maybe we can do it even before that. We can be even more ambitious when everybody works together. And again, I think Kern County is the right place to do that. It's the right time to do that. And we can keep accelerating and, and make a, a zero carbon a reality uh, within some years. Now, related to the work that you guys have done at National Cement to think about the viability from a business standpoint, how, do, you, do you have enough information even to see if, you know, a cement production process plus CCS, so capturing the emissions from the process and storing it, can make sense given the, the cost of these technologies and, you know, the, the cost of the, of the capture piece? Because, you know, the margin, uh, you, I imagine, I don't know very much about the cement business, but that you have, you know, margins on any, um, you have to produce a lot of cement, right? Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> does it pencil, I guess? Well, or do I you mean, not, is it, are we too early to know if it pencils? No, well, I mean, we, we are too early to, to, to give exact numbers, for sure. But you've shown some numbers earlier, and everybody has understood that uh, the, the capex associated with developing a, a a carbon capture plant, about transporting the pipeline cost, even though it may not be the cement producer doing that, but it's still going to be somebody else that will have to develop that. The injection process, we are talking about massive amount of, of capex that uh, one company cannot support by itself. Mm -hmm. And this has to be uh, somehow uh, um, incentivized. It can be a grant, it can be a tax credit, it can be, there is many, 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 many ways to incentivize that. Uh, now, long term, can we make it viable once the capex is there and once the capex has been somehow incentivized? Um, it's possible that the technology will evolve to a point because the scale up will allow to reduce cost. It's possible. It's possible also that um, beyond storage, we find also solutions for usage that will generate another source of revenue mm -hmm. that will help offset uh, the extra cost. Uh, what we need to point out also is that for the industries that uh, uh, will make that effort, 
we want to make business in California. We want to stay in Kern County. So at some point, we need also to think about what's happening outside of California. Clearly, it means that let's go. We want to be the first net zero cement plant in California. However, there is a lot of cement that is coming into California from outside of right. California, other states, other countries, etc. The business model can work only if everybody plays with the same rule. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be a some, at some point, if we don't want to talk about incentive to the producer, there needs to be a mechanism, mm -hmm. a border adjustment mechanism. Mm -hmm. That's what we call in other countries. It already exists in California for electricity. Uh, some, some electricity has, is protected when it comes from other states. So we need everybody to play with the same rules. Otherwise, it puts the local producer at a disadvantage. And we don't want to do that. We want prosperity. We want uh, to keep growing. We want to keep uh, offering jobs. Because that business about decarbonization, it's an opportunity to bring more value, more growth, more jobs to the place where we are going to do it. So Naikundi, I think this is a good uh, segue to a question I had for you. Um, so, you know, we talked about direct the, the business case for CCS from the standpoint of companies. Um, I wonder if you could share the broader economic picture for what, you know, CCS could represent. Because, you know, Bruno's articulated this, this challenge, right, that if you force industry to bear all of this cost, right, um, you, you could put put everybody out of business. <laughs> um, so where are some of the other places where this, is, this could create value for, for the community and the state? Um, OK, um, just uh, so Bruno, I know you mentioned that being the last is um, you get to hear everything. But I think being the last, you get, I, I thought we were like the main event, man. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, so just to answer your question, what I'll do is sort of talk about the economics surrounding um, CCS. and to give an overall picture. So there are a couple of entities that are going to face some benefits and costs, monetized benefits and costs. So you have the government, okay? Um, you have companies, and you also have the community. So governments or enforcement you know, entities um, will get benefits in the form of added revenues and added taxes. But the costs that they're going to incur um, involve enforcement. So if you, know, if, if you put out all these laws that these companies have to enforce, then you need to employ people, you need to train these individuals, and you need to have these folks actually um, making sure that things go the way they are supposed to. That's the government. Second one is companies. So companies will, you know, some of these companies will get benefits in the form of a new product. So there's going to be CO2, which they can reuse uh, for you know, if it's EOR or um, if, it's some, if it's a product that they can sell, that's something that they can sell and get revenue. So that's one revenue stream. But then companies also need to go through, um, you know, compliance costs and there are all these costs that they have to bear at the beginning of all these projects. That's the company side. And then for communities, if you're to look at Kern County as a region, they are jobs, right? You're going to provide jobs to individuals here. We're also going to have less CO2 in the area, and we assume that neighboring regions, as Bruno said, will also seek to reduce the CO2 emissions. And um, in terms of um, costs, they're going to be costs of externalities, spillover effects. Uh, so if you're putting up all these structures, there's you know, traffic, dust, um, you know, depending on where you put this up. Some folks have talked about valley fever. Some folks have talked about an impact on tourism, or even home values, for example. So um, all these things are going to affect uh, the cost side of, 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 um, of the community and land competition as well. So if you have ag producers or folks who are growing certain crops that may be sensitive to some of these new projects, that's going to be um, something to think about. And then finally, which I had not talked about, the fourth one is intergenerational equity. So uh, I was looking at some of the numbers in 1980s when I was born 40 years ago. Um, there are about 340 parts per million of CO2. That's 40 years ago. And right now, today, I checked, we're about 420 parts per million. So in about 40 years, we're going to have, you know, if we don't do anything, these numbers are going to continue rising. 
and that's going to be an added cost on the next generation. So we all need to think about those um, issues. Mm -hmm. That's the end of my answer. Yep. Um, uh, so Alexei, I wonder if you could, if we could drill down a level, so to speak. Um, you could tell us anything about the anticipated structure of the business relationship between entities that would store CO2 underground and producer to uh, read from an op-ed that I understand uh, was actually the most widely shared op-ed um, focused on a scientific topic in the New York Times in all of 2022. And the title of the op-ed was every dollar spent on this climate technology is a waste. And um, I just want to read a couple of paragraphs and then ask our panelists to, to comment and reflect on, on the arguments made in the, in the op-ed. Um, the author wrote, the technology called carbon capture and storage is aptly named. It's supposed to capture carbon dioxide emissions from industrial sources and pump them deep underground. It was a big winner in the climate provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act. CCS projects are subsidized by Section 45Q of the Federal Tax Code, which now offers companies a tax credit for each ton of carbon dioxide injected from 35 to 180, $180 per ton sequestered. The 45Q subsidies, which were increased under the IRA, create a perverse incentive because for companies to qualify for the subsidies, carbon dioxide must be produced, then captured, then buried. This incentive handicaps technologies that reduce carbon dioxide production in the first place, tilting the playing field against promising innovations that avoid fossil fuels in the steel, fertilizer, and cement industries while locking in long-term oil and gas use. The 45Q program is nominally a program to fight climate change, but since nearly all carbon dioxide injections subsidized by 45Q are for EOR, enhanced oil recovery, the 45Q program is actually an oil production subsidy. CCS allows for the continued production of oil and gas at a time when the world should be ending its dependence on fossil fuels. So as we talk about arguments against, this is basically you know, a very strong articulation against CCS. And so I'd like to just run through the panel and understand how you sort of process those arguments and, and what you would say. And um, Bruno, maybe we start with you and we can just go directly across. Okay. Um, I, I think that uh, op-ed is, uh, is, is uh, voluntarily provocative, um, but at least it's opening a, a good question. Um, a, as I said before, we see CCS as a necess necessary step in, in a multi-tiered program. So there is a lot of projects that are going to come. First, we do fuel switching, we do energy efficiency, we do uh, low carbon cement. We do a lot of things before we come to CCS. CCS is not uh, the, the weapon of mass destruction that will solve all the problems. So uh, to that regard, we agree with the, with the, the head in the, in the New York Times. There are a lot of things that we can do before we get to CCS. Now, can CCS work? in the long run without any kind of support, any kind of incentive, any kind of 40C, 48, and all the alphabet that goes with that. Uh, at, we feel at this time that the answer is no, because the effort is extremely massive in terms of CAPEX, in terms of, of OPEX, and at least until we find a way to um, make it economy viable and maybe just by economy of scale or maybe because we do usage instead of storage and we find new stream of revenue until that time there will be need we feel for some some forms of uh, support and protection of our industries thank um, you so i think uh, you know there's a reason why we're all here it's because of uh, we're talking about co2 and this is a global thing, and um, we need to find ways to get it out and back into the ground or back somewhere safe. So 
uh, we've, 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 we've seen a lot of technologies, we've seen a lot of technological advancement. We need to get it out, we need to get it out carefully and uh, just, you know, we need to hear a lot from um, all stakeholders. So it's a problem we need to solve and probably need to do it a little bit faster than we're talking about it. Ruth? I, my first take when I read that article was that that just underscores the amount of education that's needed. Because in the article, um, there were some statements that were technically true, but leaves out a lot of good facts. For example, um, Fortify Q was needed to incentivize CCS production. One of the, one of the um, senior official DOE states that it takes about $100 billion to get a new technology over the finish line, where you have investor and also community or public buy-in. Um, providing incentives is not novel. This has been done with a lot of new technologies. And actually, very here in California, Tesla is one of the, one of the key getting, is it received a number of guaranteed loans from the government, and look what has happened. Not only is Tesla uh, was a leader in EVs, but is also now expanding to other areas. So governments providing market incentives is nothing new and nothing novel. It's sometimes what's needed and necessary in order to get a technology over that finish line. And then the market will take place, forces, industry, technology, innovation will take place. DOE is doing and also doing a lot in these bills that were passed, the IRA, Inflation Reduction Act, and the BIL, the, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, they provide a lot of incentive and financial incentive that go beyond, that is more than what 45Q does for R&D, establishment of hubs. So the government plays a significant role here. Also, there are tax credits going to CE, clean energy, renewable energy. So providing of tax credits is nothing new. But also to, then, and also there's a, information that's left out in the article of the fact that EOR gets a less of a credit. The EOR credit is 60 versus the 130 or 180, whatever. Then also it leaves out the fact that you can't get that maximum credit unless you meet the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements of that area. So it's incentivizing jobs, incentivizing community benefits. So the article leaves out so much whereas it takes a lot of truth, but it leaves out so much. And then I think the most important thing it leaves out is what we've been talking about here all day, is that you have to reach, you have milestones you need to reach by 2030 and 2050. Without CCS, you can't get there. Now, is CCS the only mitigation tool in the toolbox? No but it's one that certain industries can't have unless you get there. And based on the latest GDP results, you're gonna need steel for a long time. You're gonna need cement. And right now, there is no technology that can substitute for the removal of the CO2 from those industries unless you deploy CCS in a manner. And yes, you do have to get it at scale. And yes, are we on a learning curve? A learning, are we on a demonstration curve? Yes, we are. But it's only as we get to that, we need to have that. And I just think that it, it shows the level of education that's needed to help the public and people who have that type of influence to be able to write pieces that are more factual. Alexei? Now that's well said from all the panelists. So I think one more fact check, and so 45Q meant to incentivize progress, and it did, right? If you look just two years ago, the world was, very, without the updated numbers, the world was different, right? Um, and if you count the projects in terms of EUR versus the sequestration, and you take the actual project that exists today plus the um, project that are planned and being executed, so there's there is twice as many storage projects than EOR projects, and EOR projects were mostly already there. Twice as many storage projects in the pipeline than 
EOR. Is that is that what you said? Sorry. That's right. So okay. that's correct. So we have about 40 fairly large uh, EOR projects that are operated, and then there is a pipeline of projects that are coming online from the CCS uh, and being planned. And so if you add it all together, there's twice as many projects that will be focused only on storage versus on EOR. And EOR, the reason why we're talking storage now is because EOR de-risked it, right? Since 70s, we've been doing EOR. So last 50 years, we've been doing EOR. And that's why we have this tool in a toolbox today to do the storage because all the learnings from the EOR. So to me, that's an important fact to remember. That's really, EOR was an enabler for us to even talk about storage today. And I think it's been a little bit under uh, recognized in this, mm -hmm. in this article. Thanks, Alexei. Thank you, panelists. I'd like to open it up to questions. Anyone would like to ask anything? And I like how, before the panel started, I like how Tony said, you need to go get some coffee before this exciting panel. So I'm sure. <laughs> uh, Lorelei here. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I couldn't see. Um, Alexa, you mentioned that uh, we need three of these projects per week for the next seven years to meet our goals. Well, Lorelei, you've got three of them, so that takes care of week one. But. Uh, What's the typical time frame to take one of these projects from idea through in actually injecting? What are some of the longest steps and what can we do to speed that up? Yeah, how long does it take? Now, fair enough, good. Is that to me? Sorry. You or anybody? Yeah, I can start with that since I'm probably the closest to the projects here. Um, so the way the time frame looks now, so government put a bunch of money, right, for IRA, so incentivize the progress, and it did that. So the next step is kind of a, make sure we optimize our regulatory processes and our internal you know, design. And so the, the timeline I see on the smaller projects from the time you kind of start doing pre-feed work, the first injection on paper, you know, it's probably like five six, year, five, six years, right? Now, all of that is based on information that we guesstimate, you know, such as, and what you can get, do to, to be faster is, uh, you know, as we submit number of these permits and as regulators understand a little better, as we understand a little better what's expected of us, I think all this will shrink. So I'm very optimistic that regulatory timelines will shrink as we go forward. But right now it's an unknown, and so we allocate quite a bit of time for that back and forth discussion, which is needed, right? The key is, uh, like in Canada, for example, Project Quest, right? It's a Starship project. Uh, a government and companies put a lot of effort to make it a perfect first-of-a-kind project, or is error-free. I shall not mess this up because, uh, you know, if you do, then the, the rest is kind of the history, right? Um, and so I think it makes sense that our regulators take time now because the first few, we cannot mess it up in this country or it will just delay our progress. So I think it's, uh, you know, yes, it takes longer, but it's okay. We need to understand each other. We need to um, figure out all the, how we meet all the requirements to the uh, best to store it safely and permanently. And uh, anyway, so that's kind of a long answer to the question. Five years. <laughs> well, first, let's promise we won't put CCS in New York State, and that will handle the New York Times. Okay, so let's just start with that. Um, so we have lots of studies that I'm familiar with that show the health impacts uh, and other impacts of climate change. Have we ever done a comparison with the cost of all of these expensive thousand dollar a ton? In other words, if society considers this important, then the cost doesn't matter. And the major issue, I'm just curious what the economist on the, uh, on the panel think about that. Yeah. There's always externalities. Right. right. Um, so I, I wouldn't be the best health economist or uh, expert in that area. So um, I'm sure there are a lot of studies, but I just haven't looked into um, each of these studies and uh, what they have found. So I, I, I just don't have an no, answer. My, right no, my question was, first of all, has anyone done a study comparing the cost of all of the CCS and what it's going to take to this other study? And second, if, you, if we're not aware of that, how do we determine when something's too expensive? That's my question. 
True. OK, so uh, for the first question, um, I have not come across a study. I probably did some more time to look for that study. Um, and then regarding CCS studies, I think uh, this is a new technology. So there are a lot of um, upcoming studies and a lot of areas where, well, actually not a lot of areas, but there are a few areas where this can only be done. So as of right now, this is a developing area. So I, I'm not familiar with any studies yet. They're probably there, but I just haven't looked into those. Yeah. I guess if you consider like, you know, costs of, of having the CO2 out there and all of the health impacts of doing things the way we're doing them, there are huge costs associated with that vis-a-vis -vis the costs of doing the CCS. So, you know, if you were to run that study, it probably would be, if we do believe and if, it's, if we consider it proven that we need this technology to prevent the worst effects, answers probably that it is cost effective, but it, then it becomes a question of financing, right? And, and James, if you look at the marginal abatement cost, you've probably seen, right, the marginal abatement cost. Yeah. Which was, uh, uh, so there's a number of um, higher concentrations of CO2. They are very affordable you know, now with the current incentives. So if you look at California, you got the $85 per ton from 45Q, plus you got the LCF. And if you just do desktop exercise, and 80% of California emissions uh, can be done with the current funding, right? right? So if you look, is that affordable today? Yes. If it was a perfect world and you only have set amount of dollars, how do you execute it? Well, just go down the marginal abatement cost, right? And like uh, cement is not in the worst shape because you guys have concentration of what, 20% CO2 concentration in a, so that's, you know, that's the middle ground, which is, you know, very attractive for the, for the CCS, for example. So, I mean, I think uh, today the market is enabled to execute the projects. The next big milestone, how can you work with communities, with regulars to go faster? To me, that's the next milestone. And uh, I think the way we need to do it, we just need to push real projects so we can have real conversations about real project versus this uh, high level studies that are very hypothetical, and that's where we are. So I think we're in a good place. I think a lot of the emissions are in the money now, you can execute, and we just need to kind of uh, do it. And, and this panel has said, CCS is not for everything. And even at Chevron, we have portfolio of things we use for decarbonization, hydrogen, mm -hmm. geothermal, offsets, renewable fuels, CCS, one of them. And CCS may not work for some regions. Like in UK, for example, they're not doing any CCS onshore. Why? Because, well, it's a dense population, but also uh, there was no public acceptance for, for that. And so they moved it offshore where it's such. And so I can see how, you know, depending on region, depending on where you're at, uh, it will change how you execute this project. To me, like CCS, yes. The question is where. The question is how fast you want to go and uh, how you execute these projects. Yeah. And, and you also have to look at, if you're looking at an economic study for CCS, it's, it's, it is a proven technology. Um, but it also is a, I won't say complex, but it is a different type of technology because you got to look at um, the, the capture, the transportation, and also the storage. Now, you know, the capture, putting it at point source in one industry may not be the same as it is in another industry. Then also, there have not been significant life cycle analysis done to get a better feel for that. So there are a lot of different variable, variables that really need to be developed. And that is one thing I think that we'll be looking at in some of those on the policy is to try to encourage the government to get some, some really good, robust LCA and, um, guidelines out there. For, so there are a lot of different variables when you're looking into the economics of it. Yeah. Um, can I just? Please, yeah. Yeah, just one thing, just to add on to what you all say. So health is just one aspect of, uh, of CCS. Um, and these projects, we know there are not very many out there. So as, an econom as a curious economist, there are very many impacts that you would look at. So there's a health impact, but then you can also look at, for example, the impacts on housing values, because you may put up houses right around there, but that impact will depend on the project that you put out there. And uh, you, know, you can keep drilling down into all these things. You can also look at the impact on tourism. If you're going to set this up somewhere in a place where um, you have a lot of folks who visit, how does that affect that, the tourism sector and the economy? And, uh, also, the scale at which uh, these impacts occur varies. Are you just going to look at a zip code? Are you going to look at the state? Are you going to look at the county? So it gets a little bit more interesting, but uh, 
it's just a good time for us to be in this area because there are a lot of interesting questions to ask. Yeah. A, lot of good, a lot of good PhD projects there. <laughs> <laughs> um, any final question? And then we'll wrap it up. All right. Well, thank you so much, panelists. This was great. And I'm going to turn it over to President Zelezny to finish out the day.